I always think it's interesting because it doesn't happen very often, but we are almost in the same place as the annual Torah cycle. And what I see interesting is that this year Shavuot was on the same day whether you did it by the rabbinical calculation or by the Sadducee calculation and now we're in the same place in numbers. This is a... I don't know, I'm one of these that's careful to say what the significance is, but this is a, a significant year. And for coming into the inheritance. We're in Numbers 13, and I'm going to... Uh, it's not a very long chapter, I'm going to read it, because we really need to read this story. This story probably story dealing with coming into the inheritance. And Yahweh spoke to Moses saying, send out for yourself men so that they may spy out the land of Canaan, which I am going to give to the sons of Israel. You shall send a man from each of their father's tribes, every one a leader among them. So Moses sent them from the wilderness of Paran at the command of Yahweh all of them men who were heads of the sons of Israel. These then were their names, from the tribe of Reuben, Shamua, the son of Zakur, from the tribe of Simeon, Shaphat, the son of Hori, from the tribe of Judah, Caleb, the son of Yephunneh, from the tribe of Ephraim, Igal, the son of Joseph, from the tribe of Ephraim, Hoshea, the son of Nun actually noon. From the tribe of Benjamin, Palti, the son of Raphu. From the tribe of Zebulun, Gadiel, the son of Sodi. From the tribe of Joseph, from the tribe of Manasseh, Gadi, the son of Susi. From the tribe of Dan, Amiel, the son of Gamali. From the tribe of Asher, Sether, the son of Michael. From the tribe of Naphtali, Nabi, the son of Vofsi. From the tribe of God, Guel, the son of Machi. Now there will be a test on those names. How many of you know that would be a lot easier to remember if they were in your language and every one of those names means something? But in English, it's a... These are the names of the men whom Moses sent to spy out the land. But Moses called Hoshea, the son of Nun, Joshua. His name was Salvation, but Moses calls him the Lord is my salvation. When Moses sent them to spy out the land of Canaan, he said to them, Go up there into the Negev, then go up into the hill country. What's the Negev like? Desert. It's just desert. Go up into the hill country, then you get up into the fertile part of the land. See what the land is like, and whether the people who live in it are strong or weak, whether they are few or many. How is the land in which they live? Is it good or bad? And how are the cities in which they live? Are they like open camps or with fortifications? How is the land? Is it fat or lean? Are there trees in it or not? Make an effort then to get some of the fruit of the land. Now the time was the time of the first ripe grapes. So they went up and spied out the land from the wilderness of Zin as far as Rehob at Lebo Hamath. When they had gone up into the Negev, they came to Hebron, where Ahiman, Sheshai, and Talmai, the descendants of Anak, were. Now Hebron was built seven years before Zoan in Egypt. Then they came to the valley of Eshkol, and from there cut down a branch with a single cluster of grapes. And they carried it on a pole between two men, with some of the pomegranates and the figs. That place was called the Valley of Eshkol because of the cluster which the sons of Israel cut down from there. So what it's telling you is it got the name after they took the fruit. That wasn't its name when they cut the fruit. When they returned from spying out the land at the end of 40 days... Isn't that where John the Baptist was born? Where's that? Eshkol. Uh, you know, I don't know. Could be. Does it actually say? I'm just remembering, I'm just remembering from when I was in Israel, there's a place 
place that I think is called Esh- Could be. Eshkalim or something like that for John the Baptist. I'll have to look that up. That's interesting. Because I know they do not, they have a traditional site of his birth. So after 40 days, they were done spying out the land. They proceeded to come to Moses and Aaron and to all the congregation of the sons of Israel in the wilderness of Paran at Kadesh. And they brought back word to them and to all the congregation and showed them the fruit of the land. Thus they told him and said, We went into the land where you sent us. And it certainly does flow with milk and honey. And this is its fruit. Nevertheless, the people who live in the land are strong. And the cities are fortified and very large. And moreover, we saw the descendants of Anak there. Amalek is living in the land of the Negev and the Hittites and the Jebusites and the Amorites in the hill country. And the Canaanites are living by the sea and by the side of the Jordan. Then Caleb quieted the people before Moses. Why does it say he quieted the people? Because what had been said to them obviously produced a clamor. We should by all means go up and take possession of it, for we will surely overcome it. But the men who had gone up with him said, We are not able to go up against the people, for they are too strong for us. So they gave out to the sons of Israel a bad report of the land, which they had spied out, saying, The land through which we have gone in spying it out is a land that devours its inhabitants. And all the people whom we saw in it are men of great size. There also we saw the Nephilim, the sons of Anak, are part of the Nephilim. And we became like grasshoppers in our own sight. And so we were in their sight. Everybody knows this story. And it's interesting that up here, chapter 13, but most of you know it. But as you listen to me, what's your impression of the spies? Why did they bring back the report they did? It's interesting that the Bible says they gave... What was bad about their report? Yeah, they, they were talking about the... Here's the interesting thing. Look at the first part. Said. Oh, and we, this came up in the sanctuary service again today. Have you noticed that every day to accept what God has said or what you're feeling? Every day. Is, am I the only one that's like this every day? Every day you have this opportunity. God said. Send out men so that they may spy out the land of Canaan, which I am going to give to the sons of Israel. So what did God tell Israel? This is, this is going to be the land I give you. So what are they saying? We can't do it. One of the things Kaya kind of alluded to it a little while ago, if will always produce disobedience. If you don't believe what God said, there's no way on earth you're doing it. And, you know, what's the bad report? And, and Bessie mentions the, the size of the people. Remember what uh, Moses commissioned. They were to go, here's what they were supposed to do. Few or many people are they strong or weak? They were to bring that back. That was, that was part of Was it good or bad? The cities, are they walled and fortified? Or are they more like open camps? Is the land fat or lean? Does it have Bring back some fruit from the land. Interesting, they actually report. So what Certainly, there. That I'm. Have you ever noticed about speech? And I was thinking about this. Speech is both a symptom and a cause. And you're going to say, "Well, what do you want?" When they came back, the ten spies, their speech told us what. 
It told us what about their inside. They were afraid. What you have, they were afraid. When they spoke out their fear, what happened to two million people? They got scared. A symptom and a cause. See, remember what Yeshua said? Out of the abundance of the heart, what? The mouth speaks. Can I say this then? What comes out of my mouth is a pretty clear picture of what's where. What's inside, what's in my heart. And ever find in Scripture the need to curb your speech and not speak what you're feeling because of the possible impact of people. Do you realize what it says in James? What does it say about the person? James 3, we all stumble in many ways. If anyone does not stumble in what he says, he is a perfect man, able to bridle the whole body as well. What, what is that? I know this is true for me. There's nothing I have a whole more time trolling than my tongue. In fact, sometimes uh, it reminds me of this, uh, these ladies are getting together for a, they're knitting, and one of them says, we've been told we shouldn't say anything unless it's good, and boy, is this good. <laughs> Have you ever noticed that sometimes you want to say something and you know it's, it won't, it can, but it's, it has this life of its own. It wants to come out. You want to say it. I find significant that one of the things that happens to us in speaking is the ability to affect what I said here. And fear is very contagious. A lot of Emotions can be contagious based on what we say. In fact, courage. I remember, and I've told you this many times because I've never forgotten, and I've seen it happen to several people, but a lady who was actually here in the community, and a wonderful lady, uh, knew all her kids, and I still keep in contact with some of them. They're not connected to the House of Aaron, but she could see that she needed a skill, so she went through a, a year or two year course studying to be a practical nurse. It wasn't a registered nurse, it's, it's an LPN. When it, she finished the course, did fine, but when it came time to take the test so that she could practice, she talked herself out of it three or four times and never took the test. So that she ended up, she could help in certain situations in the health field, but the ability she was created to be or trained to be could not be was afraid. And here's the thing. Is fear logical? It's not. See, and that's the thing you have to remember. You know, Kaya mentioned the unbelief and it produced the fear here. You know, the bad report is they're too strong for us. Now, that's a value judgment, right? Think now, what did God say? I'm giving you this land. Once in one promise, he's given them, has he failed? He set them free from Pharaoh. He took them through the Red Sea. They fought Amalek. And, I mean, so far, every promise has come, but their fear... One of the things that I, as I looked at this story, just like this lady I told you about, fear's not logical because you think about it. What, so what if she takes the test and... So what? Take it again. I had a classmate, and he was not dumb by any means. He took the state board four or five times before he passed it. And, you know, I applaud him because a lot of people would have quit. And he's a good vet today. 
He was one of those people, taking tests was not his forte. And uh, I hate to tell you, I want to talk about that. But my dad, I remember, you know, I've been thinking about dad a lot. <laughs> those of you who have lost parents, I'm sure you go through this. Little things remind you, and you think, well, I'm going to go tell, oh, he's not around. Well, dad would have, oh. But dad, he would never talk about himself. I, I'm very much the son of my dad, other ways not. That's when I'm not. My kids know all my stories. Dad, you had to drag his stories out of him or catch him as they rebound or ricocheted because he didn't talk about himself. But when he was in the service, in the Air Corps, one of the things they did, because they were going to be putting people on ships, they had to teach people to be able to jump overboard and survive in the water. And sometimes you would have, uh, what do you call the, no, what do you call the little, it's like an inner tube, what are the, the rings, whatever you call, yeah, life preserver, that's what it is, thanks Ron, uh, anyway, sometimes you had it, sometimes you didn't, see now, just when dad was telling me this, I can't, I was just, blah. but they trained them, they, they, they were teaching them how to do this. It came time that they were going to take him out in the water and they had to jump off this big ship. One of the guys was so afraid. I don't know if you've ever seen those big army trunks. He set his hand, he lifted the trunk lid up, put his hand down and smashed it down, almost cut off all four fingers. Why? He was terrified. And I've, again, I, I, I was just, the story came to me as I was thinking because and it's almost always destructive. It almost always, because thinking about it, I, I could almost sympathize with this fellow because I don't like water and I don't like heights. This is a perfect... What's the solution to fear? What'd you say? Faith. It's the opposite, right? Fear and faith are the opposite. You, you have to have belief, confidence. And so when you, when you have this bad speech, the, the cure is not fixing your tongue. I mean, I thought about this. We could tape all our mouths shut. Gerald, you... Well, this is, this is one of the things I find interesting because your, your fear responses are part of that low-level uh, brain activity. They happen Almost visceral and reactionary, aren't they? they? I would agree. What do, what do the rest of you think? I agree with Gerald that without the Holy Spirit, our, we will give in to our fear. Especially, I mean, when you, when you look at it, and, and the thing about it is, is that uh, it's not bad to be afraid. The problem is letting your fear you, and I like what you brought up there, Gerald, it's a visceral reactionary, it, it's in a place to think about it, and it it very often isn't good for you. It, it doesn't have you do something that's in your best interest. But fear, I mean, when you get to a certain place in fear, quivering mass of jelly, you can't be reached. I, we went, uh, when we went to uh, Puerto Vallarta with Ron and Robin, one of the things that Ron was convinced we wanted to do was go on the zip line. Anybody here ever done that before? And it's actually a lot of fun. But you go up in, in Puerto Vallarta, we went up this circular, have you ever seen the old metal steps that it looks like you go, they'd fall over? And so we went, oh, like this, up about 40 feet. And I, it was bothering me a little bit, but Ron and I started making a joke. And Robin let us know this was not a time for joking. The joking was over. Okay, I mean, she was terrified, and 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 the first they're smart. The first thing they do is have you sit in that little 
harness, strap yourself, and you'll go about, oh, 20 feet. And when you actually live through that and your heart starts beating up in your eardrums and, and you're ready to try the next one, what's amazing, by the end of the day, we were going half a mile across 700-foot ravines and it was, we were loving it. But at first, <laughs> I mean, I don't like heights. I still remember, I'm sure Robin could tell you, boy, she cut Ron off. <laughs> and both of us were doing it because, I don't know about you, I handle stress by joking. And I've several times joked in the most inappropriate times at the worst, and people are thinking I'm trying to be irreverent. No, I'm trying to deal with it. And, uh, but just thinking about that, I agree, the, the, the answer to fear is faith. And faith comes from knowing the truth. I mean, again, I just thank Kaya for being sensitive to the Holy Spirit because it's been kind of a tempestuous week. It was joy in my anniversary. And we planned three separate days we were going to do something, and every day something different happened. And I had weeks like this where you're, the best laid plans of mice and men, gang after glee, go off and ugly. But... Uh, I came in here today and we just started to worship and I, it was a wonderful way for me to start. The people of Israel live. My father, our father lives. And what, I hap what happens is we were singing the truth and then we got to that place, how great thou art. It brings you into a place of peace, of faith. And it gives us the strength to deal with our fears because our fears aren't going away. But we can conquer our fear. And I, I love, you know, it goes along with what you said, Gerald. God did not give us the spirit of timidity. But power, love, and a sound mind, and really it's self-control, is, is what that says. John, yes. I just want to point this out. Hebrews says that faith not only believes that God exists, but that he <laughs> Faith and fear are opposites, but in a certain sense, they're the same thing placed in a different thing. Fear is faith that evil will, will get you. That's right. True faith is that good is coming to you. And, and it's, it's either faith and fear, or I mean faith and evil, or faith and good. And true faith is the faith in God's goodness. That's a nice way to look at it, that fear is faith that a bad result is going to happen. Gerald. sent them out to gather information. They didn't send them out there to say, how's this going to happen? On the other hand, if you have enough wisdom, enough faith, to take the companion question that says, I can't do this, I'd like to see how God is going to do this. Because that means that you have faith that he will accomplish it, and it's obvious to you that you don't know how. But yet that reinforces your faith. And, and if these guys could have gone out with that same question, they wouldn't, they wouldn't have come back with that we can't do this, but they'd have come back with this is an incredible place. How is God going to do this? And they could have expressed faith to the people. Oh, what, you, what you say is so true, but it reminds me of something that might be helpful here, and that is we have a nature that the Bible calls the old nature or the fleshly nature. And every case that says to kill that. That in some way you, uh, doesn't, isn't there a place where Paul says don't give way to the flesh? And I think when you look at what those spies did, they were given a commission to go look at the land that God was giving them. And like you said, it would have been completely understandable if they came back and said, the cities are walled, the people are huge, we don't know how we're going to do this. Let's get together, let's pray. What's the, what's the strategy that God's giving us to take the land he gave to us? That's what yeah, but they think, to me, they think like slaves. They, they saw themselves, like you said, Kaya, what do slaves, I mean, how would it be to be a slave? I, I, I believe of, your master has a bad day, you're going to have a real bad day. And it's easy to judge them, but it's important, to, I think, to note that the slave mentality has to die. 
The thing in me that, that as opposed to what you're saying, it says, you know, I can't do this, but my God can through me. Uh, it shows why it's important to hold on in God's promise. Because I think, I think what Caleb and Joshua were able to do is keep the context of God's promise always in their minds so that when they saw the giants, they'd be like, wow, that's a giant. How are we going to kill those guys? Because God <laughs> says we are, so wow. And, you know, they saw it and it was... It was always in the context of we're going to get those guys. This is this is amazing. It was always kept there. David had that same thing at Goliath. Exactly. You know that that's common theme. That, that faith is is putting in context. Well, God promised this, so this is going to be amazing. Well, and, and I think we all know what it's like to see to come up against something that looks too big for us. And in that situation, it's a little bit like you alluded to earlier, Gerald. If we've trained ourselves to believe what God has said, it doesn't feel the right action. Every bad situation, we go to default and go to what just comes out of the flesh. Then, then we see that happening. Uh, there's a, the passages that are... The passage today... Are, uh, there's one of Psalm 31, How great is your goodness, 19-24, which you have stored up for those who fear you, which you have wrought for those who take refuge in you before the sons of men. You hide them in the secret place of your presence from the conspiracies of man. You keep them secretly in a shelter from the strife of tongues. Blessed be Yahweh, for he has made marvelous his loving kindness to me in a besieged city. As for me, I said in my alarm, I am cut off from before your eyes. Nevertheless, you heard the voice of my supplications when I cried to you. O oh, love Yahweh, all you his godly ones. Yahweh preserves the faithful and fully recompenses the proud doer. Be strong and let your heart take courage, all you who hope in Yahweh. How many times do you think it says in Psalms to be strong and take heart? To be strong and take courage. And what did the Lord tell Joshua after Moses died. Be strong, be bold. You know, it's interesting that when you think about what I said a minute ago, faith and fear and the relationship, to have, to fear God actually is the purest faith in mm. who he is. Mm -hmm. well, it's, it's interesting to me that the fear of God sets us free from the fear of man and the fear of evil. Uh, and, and another thing I just want to I already mentioned this we'll talk a little bit about the inheritance I think it's very important to note that fear is what kept Israel out and that fear will always keep what Paul calls it or the, it will always keep nature from getting what God I'll go back to the little story about the woman that wouldn't take the test It's interesting that we will be more afraid of failure than we will be in the belief in the good that could come from accepting the challenge. I was just thinking about the history of them being uh, at this point. God had delivered them from Egypt, He'd saved them from the Egyptians. But they've been wandering around in this Negev area being attacked by Amalekites. The, the promise God had given them was, I will give you, take you to a land flowing with milk and honey. Okay, that's, that's a mental picture. But the physical experience they had had so far had been dry desert, enemies, nothing good was coming out of this in their experience, wandering around through this area. So God says... I want you guys to go get, essentially, to take pictures and bring them back so these people can actually see what this promise is that I've given them. And it was, it was the opinion that went with it that soured the beauty that, that those pictures brought back. And yeah, it was kind of the, yeah, the interpretation. It was their first real taste of what this promise was comprised of. And it went bitter in the mouths of the people who brought the report back. Yeah, and it's interesting how that happens. And I, I thought about this too. Sometimes 
our flesh thinks the ultimate good is preserving the flesh. Faith says the ultimate good is what God wants for me. See, when, when you look at this, taking the land, it's going to cost some people their lives, isn't it? I, I was, and I wish I had uh, printed this off, but do you remember about a year ago when the three Israeli teenagers were kidnapped? And uh, no event has brought Jews together over the world like that in a long time. And then they found out later that within a day of their capture, they'd been tortured and killed. And you know what really is amazing to me? I was just reading this past week. The three mothers of those boys have come together and started uh, groups of supporting people who have lost loved ones, uh, things that you can do. When, when, and the, the amazing thing, like I say, I wish I had it. The one lady, she's the mother of Natalie Frank. And her faith in God and her belief in his goodness and her, her belief that God has them in the land is just amazing to me. She's lost her son, but because she has this eternal perspective, her heart is broken, but she goes on. Her fear is not stopping her. And I, I, I was just stood in awe reading about these three mothers that said, this isn't going to defeat us. We're going to go on, and what's more, we're not going to hate. I love the fact that an Israeli youth captured a Palestinian kid and burned him alive in his car right after this happened. What's that? Let's, let's, let's have the whole story, because that's pretty awful. When these mothers heard about that, they went down to the parents of the Palestinian boy and said, no parent should ever have to go through this. We want you to know we love you and we support you. And we would never, it does not bring our boys back to kill your boys. I, I love that fact, not the other one. <laughs> you started off with uh, the word that Megan yes. sent you. Yes, the season. And uh, I just was thinking that for you and for us, this word, the timeliness of saying this is the time of entering your inheritance, that whatever opposition seems to come up in our report of what the inheritance is for us, that we keep in mind that God's promising it, and it's a good inheritance, and to give a good report, and to speak highly and well of what God is promising us in this season, just to have a Joshua and Caleb perspective on what so we keep the promise in mind that God says this, and the inheritance. So I, I, I can completely would confirm that word. I think it's something that I agree. other people would confirm as well. Um, and just... I just think it's important to maybe pray or, or recognize that it's a time to have a Joshua and Caleb attitude, Joshua and Caleb attitude towards that. There's something that goes along with that. You know, I like this layout in these writings, but what I don't like is things aren't on the right spot on the page. No one's ever had that problem, have you? Isn't that amazing? I, I knew that's where it was. Sometimes what I know isn't so. That's never happened to you either, has it? Uh, the one that says the house of Aaron has not fallen. Well, I, I thought that was... Oh, yeah, I found it. 269, it's 268. And as you were saying that, Kaya, one of the things I think is important for me and important for all of us is to every day God's portion for us. I, I love the uh, Psalm 9, Psalm 6. Three lines have fallen for me in pleasant places. You know that song, You are my God, you alone are my joy. Read the song because the Catholic priest that wrote it took it right out of Psalm 16. It's just right out of it. But he says, you are my portion and cup. It is you that I claim for my prize. And, and it's a Supreme. This uh, 
Levitical Writings 268, verse 4. As we approach the inheritance, how many of you know that sometimes it's discouraging? I, I found myself at times discouraged. I see all my failings. I see the places where I don't get the... Stop and I realize, about me, we are in deep doo-doo. This isn't about me. This is about you and me, but participating with God, just as Gerald said earlier. I know I can't do this, Lord, by myself, but I know I can with you. For the house of Aaron shall not fall, nor has it fallen, for it is likened unto the tree of life, which stands forever and ever in the garden of the Lord, with its roots firmly fixed in the creation of our salvation, for which we give praise unto the Lord. That's a good... Remember, Psalm 73 to me is a powerful picture of this power of words. Let's just put it that way. In Psalm 73, that was 268.4 by the way. Levi is the son of Asaph and he's on his way to the temple and he's having a bad day. When he looks around, it looks to him like everybody who doesn't care about God, everybody who's just out looking out for themselves, everybody who's crooked, violent, they have success, they have no problems. And again, how many of you can tell this isn't factual? Everybody has problems. Good people and bad people, we all have problems. But he's going on and on and he's, his spirit is so grieved until he comes into the sanctuary. But here's the thing that I think it he says in Psalm 73 verse 15, if I had speak thus, behold, I would have been the generation of your children. What he's saying is that when you feel discouragement, when you feel yourself being brought down, that's a good time to go somewhere and not say anything just as a root of bitterness can defile do it. It comes right out of your mouth. And when you're feeling bad, I mean, I don't know about the rest of you, I remember reading, uh, it was an article on leadership, and this man was the pastor of the church, he came into the board meeting, everybody was talking and having a good time, uh, you know, having coffee and donuts, and he walks in, and, and he's kind of upset about some things. And so he gets up and he talks about the state of the finances of the church and the spiritual... And he was just going on and on, all this stuff that he was in anguish about. And he looked out. And all these men that had just been full of joy, talking to each other, he just said, he looked at them, and the Holy Spirit said, just as clear as a bell, you've just every man here. And he just had to fall on his knees in repentance. Because people don't They don't need, like this psalmist, he felt all this anguish and that was, you know, but the Holy Spirit comes to him and he goes, oh, if I'd spoken this way, I would have betrayed your children. Now sometimes we do it. But there's a need to repent and to say, Lord, stop me from this. You now self-control which is a fruit of the Spirit, would stop me from that way. And uh, listen to what he says in verse 21, when my heart was embittered and I was pierced within, and that's what happens when you have problems, when you start saying, well, there's not as much and no one's following We're on and on and on, and you dig this hole. Then I was ignorant. I was like a beast before you. Whoa. But it's true. When we get taken, it goes back to what you said, Gerald, about the fear thing. When it's operating down there in those parts of your brain, it's like an animal. What happens if you corner a bull? It wouldn't matter how big of a piece of equipment you had in front of it. It's going to try to go over it, through it, under it. It doesn't care. It's in this blinding, instinctive, could be, root as I was like a beast before you nevertheless 
with you. You have taken hold of my right hand. With your counsel you will guide me and afterward receive me to glory. Whom have I in heaven but you? See what happens to his perspective? And this happens just because of what we morning. You come in and you say, Lord, I've chosen to come to the mountain. I'm, I've chosen to accept that I'm washed clean by the water of the word through Yeshua. He's waiting there in his house and he says, John, I'm this morning, can I wash your feet? And I'm like, you wash my feet? He says, yeah, unless I wash you, you have no part of me. And he takes me to the altar of sacrifice where he gave everything and he says, and you walk through this and then you go, I'm in God's presence. He's got my right hand. It's all right. I can face my fears and I can, it isn't that you don't have challenges. We have challenges. But there's, we can meet our challenges in His strength or we can try to meet them in our strength and I can tell you that in our strength we'll end up like these ten spies. We don't have the ability. But in His strength I can do all things through the Messiah. And the other thing that I think is so potent here that, that the Levite here mentions that when we encourage each other, we exponentially encourage, we exponentially increase the ability to accomplish God's plan. When we discourage each other, unfortunately, it's just the opposite. We take that, that ability away. He says, my flesh may fail, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. For behold, those who are perish, destroyed all those who are unfaithful to you. But as for me, the nearness of God is my good. I have made the Lord God my refuge that I may tell of all your works. It, Psalm 73 is such a blessing to me because every human being, I think, has had those days. Remember, when we feel this need to speak and we know it's negative, we know it's discouraging, we know that destructive or tearing down. Ask God for grace that you'll go someplace. Don't do it. Don't give voice to it. Because tell those around you, you injure yourself. I love the fact that in the New Testament it doesn't identify a lot of Levites. But it does identify some. One that identifies prominently is Barnabas. And do you know what Barnabas was known for? He was an encourager. They, people loved to have Barnabas because he was going to encourage them. He was going to build them up. There's a statement in the writings, blessed is he that adds one little teeny thing to the foundation, and most cursed is he who takes something away. We are called to be edifiers. We're called to be builders. Tongues are incredibly powerful in the ability to edify and in the ability to tear down. And Paul says, I thank God for the abilities that he's given me for building you up, not for tearing you down. Go ahead, Kaya. Yes, we're going to sing 350 as the closing... And after we sing, Gerald, would you close the service, please? 358.